Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, June 18th, we're studying Jeremiah chapter 21, verses 1 to 10. When King Zedekiah desperately seeks the word of the Lord, Jeremiah preaches the truth that the Lord is, in fact, bringing Babylon against Jerusalem to destroy it. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Joel Heckman. Pastor Heckman serves at St. John's Lutheran Church in Okarchi, Oklahoma. Pastor Heckman, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Thanks for having me on. As we get started, let's talk a little bit of context, Pastor Heckman. What do we need to know about Jeremiah, his ministry, and then uh, particularly about this text, King Zedekiah is mentioned, so we can say a few things about him as well in terms of context. Mm Mm-hmm. So historically, it's it's pretty helpful to look at what's going on in this text. And I, I think you mentioned in your study of the context, this passage comes probably about the year 588 BC when um, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Empire of Babylon are attacking Jerusalem. They're sieging the city. It is um, kind of the uh, the heart of of Isaiah or sorry Jeremiah's ministry, or you know, a little bit toward the tail end, but in in a really volatile point where he began his ministry to uh, what we would call the Southern Kingdom of Judah, and he was a prophet there from 626 through a little bit of this exile that Israel's right on the cusp of going into. But um, he started about when Josiah reigned as king of Judah, and then he comes on the scene, and and he's seeing the end of his ministry come close here as um, Zedekiah's rule also comes to a close. We'll mention a little bit more about him in a second, but if not to get into too much backstory, but if you go back all the way to the reign of King Solomon, the third king of uh, the United Kingdom of Israel, before they split into the northern kingdom of Israel with 10 tribes and the southern kingdom of Judah with those two tribes, uh, Solomon had uh, had made some pagan uh, alliances. He had married pagan wives, introduced idolatry into Israel, and after his death, kingdom split north, south, Israel, Judah, and then king after king kind of came back and forth, and, and some reformed, like Josiah was a, a very important reformer in the former in the kingdom of Judah. Um, but Israel kind of just seemed to keep falling back into their idolatry and and prophet after prophet before Jeremiah had called them to repentance, said, return to the Lord, um, repent of your sins, uh, renounce this idolatry. And finally, uh, Jeremiah is, is given the ta- a very undesirable task of saying, all right, the uh, you might say the jig is up. This this is uh, this is over. Um, the the judgment is coming. The consequences are coming for your persistent and continued rejection of the word of the Lord. And a lot of people refer to Jeremiah actually as the weeping prophet because he had such a an undesirable task ahead of him. Uh, he had very few friends. His message was unpopular. People were very, their ears were very attuned to false prophets at this time, which is something Jeremiah preaches against with with great force in his in this book. And uh, all the false prophets are saying what the people wanted to hear, but Jeremiah comes along and says, what is the word of the Lord? And even in verse one that we'll get to in a minute, it says the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. So it wasn't from him as it was from the you know, lying prophets. It was from themselves. This is Jeremiah's kind of situation he he's on he's on the tail end of, of 400 years or so of idolatry and now he's come to say all right judgment is finally coming there's an exile uh, babylon is going to come through and destroy jerusalem destroy the temple destroy the walls and take you away so that's why we 
see Jeremiah just especially lamenting if you, and, and that's part of the context too, which I'll get to in a second prior to this, um, just a lament from Jeremiah about his situation. And then just a little bit about King Zedekiah. He's mentioned a couple, at least a couple times in this passage. Uh, he is the last king of Judah. Uh, as I said, there's kind of been a long line of kings going before him. You know, Josiah brought in reforms and then some of his sons. And I think one of his grandsons were, um, appointed to rule after that and after they had ended their rules zedekiah is selected by king nebuchadnezzar to be kind of a vassal king uh someone who is in submission to nebuchadnezzar and so zedekiah was he sometimes defended jeremiah and sometimes he kind of hung him out to dry so he was uh people call him the vacillating king where he goes from one extreme to the other and he's indecisive and then finally uh his end came when uh he was kind of conspiring with other nations to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. That doesn't work out. Um, the walls of Jerusalem are br- finally breached. Zedekiah tries to escape with some of his men. He's captured. Uh, his sons are executed right in front of them. And then he is um, sent away to Babylon in exile. And I, I, if I'm not mistaken, he dies, I think, in, in the middle of that exile. So really kind of a tragic story with uh, Zedekiah, but it, it shows just how bad things can get when you reject the word of the Lord and reject his prophets. Um, but this, so you kind of get the sense, this is just a, you know, if, if, uh, you know, this came to a pastor on call day, you get to go to the <laughs> nation of Israel and, um, preach this, this message to them. Here's your context. Uh, I, I don't know how many pastors would be thrilled about that. So I can't really blame Jeremiah. Um, that's that's kind of the historical context of, that we get into. <laughs> sure. I mean, Jeremiah's call documents back in chapter <laughs> one certainly laid out what his ministry was going to be like in terms of the breaking down, the overthrowing, the plucking up. There is building and planting, but that's certainly not the majority of Jeremiah's ministry. Our text mm-hmm. today is is a part of that breaking down tearing down, overthrowing, though there is a a note of hope toward the end, but it's a rather surprising one. And I I know we'll talk about that, this hope that that is there, this way of life that that is there. It's rather unexpected, I think, both to Zedekiah and the the hearers then, and probably to us as well. And, And I think that'll provide some good discussion for us as well. You're right. The lament is part of the context. Jeremiah has just gotten through one of his lowest, perhaps his lowest lament within the book where he's, he's basically said, I, I wish I wasn't born. And yet mm-hmm. we see him in this text continue to faithfully preach the word that God has given, even when it is a, a difficult word. So let's go ahead and take a look at the text for today. It is Jeremiah chapter 21, verses 1 to 10. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him Peshur, the son of Malchiah, and Zephaniah, the priest, the son of Masiah, saying, Inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is making war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful deeds and will make him withdraw from us. Then Jeremiah said to them, Thus you shall say to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands and with which you are fighting against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans who are besieging you outside the walls. And I will bring them together into the midst of this city. I myself will fight against you with outstretched hand and strong arm in anger and in fury and in great wrath. And I will strike down the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They shall die of a great pestilence. Afterward, declares the Lord, I will give Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants and the people in this city who survived the pestilence, sword and famine, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of their enemies, into the hand of those who seek their lives. He shall strike them down with the edge of the sword. He shall not pity them or spare them or have compassion. And to this people you shall say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out and surrenders to the Chaldeans who are besieging you shall live and shall have his life as a prize of war. For I have set my face against this city for harm and not for good, declares the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. That's our text for today, Jeremiah 21 verses 1 to 10. So, Pastor Heckman, the text again sets the context for us. 
Zedekiah sends some of his officials. We've got Pashur, the son of Malchiah. This is a different Pashur than we met in yesterday's text. That was Pashur, son of Immer, just so that we're, we're making sure we know, try to keep the characters straight. We don't much, know much <laughs> about these guys. Then Zephaniah, the priest, son of Messiah. This would be not Zephaniah, the prophet that we know from later in the in the scriptures, another Zephaniah, who's one of the the officials in the reign of King Zedekiah. And, and Zedekiah sends them to Jeremiah. This seems like a good sign. Ask the Lord, inquire. Here's Nebuchadnezzar making war. Maybe, perhaps is the way the ESV translates it. Maybe God will deal with us according to his wonderful deeds. What should we make of this request from King Zedekiah? Well, I took a look at it and and like you said, it's... It seems like a good sign when someone is inquiring of the Lord, but the placement of this is really the the problem because it's coming on the tail end of um, the siege of Jerusalem. It's after Jeremiah's message has been rejected and all the other prophets. So it really what it points to is in some ways a last ditch effort to get out of this mess. It's a des- it's a desperate move on Zedekiah's um, on Zedekiah's part, which interestingly I think his name is the Lord is my righteousness. So it's kind of an irony there where um, okay, finally you're doing something that you're supposed to, but you're you're doing it with the wrong motive. Um, he can't placate Nebuchadnezzar. All the false gods that they've been worshiping up to this point, of course, have let them down. They can't save them. So now it's sort of Zedekiah says, Well, I guess I don't have any other avenue. I guess I'll see what God can do for me. And it feels like kind of a get out of jail free card that Zedekiah sees this as where I, I'm going to use God for my purposes when I need him. Um, it'll be kind of a pragmatic relationship, sort of utilitarian, where if he's useful, I need him. If not, you know, when things are going well, I don't think I really need him. And so really what I see here is a last resort, a last ditch effort from Zedekiah to say, okay, I don't have anywhere to turn. And now I guess God's the solution. Um, when really uh, he's using this word perhaps, and we, we see that used in a, in a couple other contexts that I'll get to in a second, but perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful deeds and will make him withdraw from us. So the wonderful deeds that should have set the tone for Israel um, earlier, you know, when, when you see God creating the world, God delivering Noah, through, and his family through the flood, God delivering Israel from Egypt, that should have been an impetus to say, we should be faithful to our God, uh, not, well, here's what God can do, and I'll just use that when I need it. Um, so where do we see this this perhaps language used properly? It, I read this, and it made me think of a couple passages. Um, the prophet Joel in, in chapter 2, verses 13 through 14 writes, Return to the Lord your God. This is a popular Ash Wednesday text, uh, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. So Joel doesn't see God as the, you know the last resort. He sees someone, you know, you lean on him at all times. And when you sin, um, there's, it's to be followed by repentance and, and that's good because God delights in, in those who repent and shows love to those who, uh, turn to him for mercy and, and grace. He says he is gracious and merciful. So, um, repentance is, is the proper attitude when one is sin, not, okay, well, I'm kind of up a creek here. God, can you help me? <laughs> um, and then we just did a Bible study on Jonah recently here at St. John's, and it, it made me think of Jonah uh, chapter 3, where the king of Nineveh, this pagan who has just heard a five-word Hebrew sermon from Jonah, says, uh, But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. So you see in both these contexts in Joel and in Jonah, the, the people are responding to preaching or, or being given preaching 
uh, in terms of you've sinned and you need to repent. So it's in a completely different context for even the king of Nineveh knows uh, we don't deserve mercy. We've done evil. And the law has come to us and convicted us of our sin. So God might show mercy or might show judgment, but in either case, he's justified. Um, so they are turning to God as the center of their life, not just an afterthought. And and this really does, again, go back to Christ to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So, so we see, uh, I mean, not just in King Zedekiah's life and Israel's lives, but, but our own lives too. When we push the Lord to the fringes, things go poorly. Uh, but then God calls us back in with people like Jeremiah, with, with family members, with pastors to say, repent. Um, I'm not to be an afterthought in your life. I am, I am, the Lord, your God, who you serve and worship alone. And um, that's the way life is meant to be. But here it's just, you can see Zedekiah is just desperate. uh, And that's why he turns to God. Yeah. I mean, it's hard, you know, I suppose within Jeremiah 21, there's no motive attached, but the, the sense of desperation I think comes through in other places in the book of Jeremiah. As, As you were talking, I was reminded all the way back in chapter two, the Lord in, in preaching against the idolatry of the people, he was describing what they'd done. This is Jeremiah two twenty seven. They have turned their back to me and not their face, but in mm-hmm. the time of their trouble, they say arise and save us. So, I mean mm-hmm. that what Jeremiah has already preached against certainly seems to fit with what Zedekiah is going through here. And I think you're, you're latching onto that word perhaps is helpful because it does show up in other places, but the, the difference is this matter of repentance, as you pointed out. And I, I really appreciate the way you, the passage from Joel goes where, where the return to the Lord, your God is based on his grace and his mercy, his slowness to anger, his steadfast love. Whereas Zedekiah bases his perhaps on the wonderful deeds that God Mm -hmm. has done, which it's certainly not wrong to think of God doing all of his wonderful deeds, as you were pointing out, Noah, the Exodus, and a lot of examples from the Old Testament are wonderful deeds. But from the lips of Zedekiah in the context of Jeremiah, it comes more in the way of kind of like the Pharisees will ask Jesus for a sign, like, show me your God, rather than in the Mm -hmm. sense of faith. You know, you'd, you'd kind of like, Zedekiah, if if he is coming at this from a an attitude of repentance, it, you think of more of perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to His mercy or according to His steadfast love, not just mm-hmm. sort of like God do that cool thing again where you make the enemies go away, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, yep. And 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 with that kind of attitude, you know, the the answer that that they're given certainly makes a lot of sense, but it is difficult to hear. So there's the prayer of Zedekiah. And Jeremiah gives a response from the Lord, beginning in verse four. And and it's very striking. You know, this is what you're going to tell him. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will turn back the weapons of war. And, and one of the things, as we think about the answer as a whole, you see this, the Lord is the one who's doing this. I will turn back the weapons. I will bring the Babylonians. I myself will fight against you. So I mean, we'll, we can talk about this answer in detail. Take us into those first couple of verses. So verses three and four, we see, yeah, again, this is, I think it's one of seven phrases where God says, I will do something or I have done something. And the later ones have a little bit more, I guess maybe one of them has a little bit more grace involved, but these are typically very terrifying utterances from God. And, and, we see maybe getting a little bit more to the heart of why is this happening? Um, Because Israel is turned away from the covenant promises of God. And he says, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands. I will bring them together in the midst of the city, Babylon and the Chaldeans. And I referenced, uh, I I looked in, in some of my notes, I looked back at Jeremiah two verses 10 through 12. And One of the commentaries I had made this uh, a helpful point uh, where Jeremiah says, For cross to the coasts of Cyprus and see, or send to Kadar and examine with care. See if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate. 
declares the Lord. So you might see these utterances from God, I will turn back your weapons, I will strike down uh, inhabitants of the city, which we'll get to in a second. You might be shocked by that. But the real shock is the fact that Israel, uh, how it, they've turned their back on God when, first of all, it's it's uncommon for pagans to do that, and Israel does it. But then Israel changed their object of worship in the midst of, you know, peak success and, and material wealth and blessings and all this, where God was um, giving them safe harbor and um, prosperity as a nation. And they say, okay, God, uh, you know, we want more or we want something else. You're not enough for us. And I think that's quite telling as we get further into this passage here, where we see what's Israel's mindset what's their context um the heart of the problem with israel is they they thought they were so successful they didn't need god uh their own empty righteousness had really blinded them to gods and that's i i want to say that's pretty telling for us too because i often see in my own life and and maybe we see this in our the lives of our fellow christians when we are most successful that might be when our faith is most vulnerable because our sinful nature, again, tells us we only need God when things are desperate, kind of like Zedekiah was here. Um, and so Jeremiah gives them this harsh word. No, uh, this is the judgment that comes. And this is what happens when um, you push God aside. Um, and, you know, while, while these successes aren't bad, uh, while, you know, job success, material possessions, uh, wealth, these things aren't inherently bad, they do have a way of blinding us to God. And um, God gives us word and sacrament to safeguard us from that blindness. Just as we see here, Jeremiah is that law, um, the law and gospel, of course. He has messages of hope, too. But again, his message is primarily law here, where... <laughs> Thus says the Lord God of Israel, behold, I will turn back the weapons of war. God himself is going to do this. So he's, I think, bringing them the shock of the law um, to show them just how far they've fallen, um, just how terrible things are. And as we get into a little bit more of these, we'll see just how um, just how difficult it, it, it is to fathom how far Israel's fallen um, and how seriously God takes sin too, uh, because we, um, you know, maybe we, I can't remember, I, th I think it's one of the Lenten hymns or maybe one of the Holy Week hymns, you who, uh, think of sin, but lightly, um, I'm blanking on Stricken, the rest of it, but, and afflicted. You who, right. Yeah. Um, and maybe this is one of those things where Israel's taken its sin lightly and, mm -hmm. As with Jeremiah too, he's pointing out this is just absurd, guys, and, and something needs to change because for God has been long suffering with you, and um, you haven't haven't taken that to heart. So this, things are going to get pretty bad, but they will also get better too. But this is kind of the the heart of that difficult part for Israel. Mm -hmm. Your comments there about how it's often our material successes that end up blinding us, I think are, are very well taken in, in the book of, and, I, and as you were talking about that, I was thinking about the, the parable of the sower where Jesus describes the various ways that the word of God is attacked. And I, I think the, the material successes that fits in nicely. And I'm looking at Matthew 13. So I don't, mm -hmm. I think it's the same order in, in all the, the gospels that record this, but in Matthew 13, it's the third type of soil, the, the seed that's sown among the thorns, where it is the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches choke the world or word and it mm -hmm. proves unfruitful. I think sometimes we forget that. And and we tend to think of it's the the second type of soil, you know, the persecution that arises on account of the world word, that's what's going to cause us the most difficulty in staying true to the faith. Jeremiah deals with the persecutions, but the the people of Judah and Jerusalem at large, it seems, are are dealing more with they think everything's fine. This peace, peace when there really isn't any peace. Or look, there's the temple of the Lord. Everything's fine. <laughs> this is seeming mm -hmm. to be the <laughs> mantra of that. You know, everything's okay. Nothing's really wrong, and and we're good. And that is a terribly deceptive thing. It was deceptive for the people of Judah, and I think, and and. It, get just a few reflections here before we go to break. It, it remains a deceptive thing, I think, for us in our world today. 
Yeah. And, um, again, you, you I guess you kind of have to be careful talking about, you know, is this a bad thing when you see success in your life? No, but what is, what is our sinful nature always doing? It's trying to focus us on something other than God. We get back to the first commandment. You should fear love and trust in God above all things. That love portion of it is particularly difficult because we, uh, the object of our love and the object of our worship, you might even say, is so easily misplaced where, um, you know, we see it in our world today where people are so busy. Uh, it's almost as though busyness itself is the object of our love. And then what is that busyness working toward? It's, it's greater wealth, greater material possessions, greater uh, fame uh, in your peer groups. And uh, ag- again, you know, with things like sports, things like uh, careers, uh, you know, buying things, it's not inherently bad. But as I think this should be a warning to us is maybe take a step back and ask, why am I doing this? And what is my relationship with the Lord look like in light of that? Um, you know, am I, am I giving uh, so much time to these things, so much love and attention to them that uh, God gets leftovers or nothing at all? And I think that's what Israel said, but, you know, especially in our world, you're not, you know, we, we worship happiness too. We want to, you say kind of the, the idol is happiness in a lot of ways. And again, I got to be careful talking about this where I, I don't want you to be unhappy, but our measure of success should not be, does this make me happy? Which I think was Israel's pitfall is we want to be happy. We don't want to be faithful. Sometimes those things line up where if you're faithful to God, um, happiness and, and, and feelings of joy and, uh, positivity you might say, follow that. But very often, um, what we do to be faithful to God will bring unhappiness. And that's not a bad thing. It's just the world in which we live where uh, when God calls us to do something, he, he says there's Christ makes it clear. There's going to be suffering uh, to be faithful. Um, now that doesn't mean, you know, quit your job and sell everything, but it does maybe mean reassess how you look at what God has given you. Um, and, and say, why, why do I think I need this? Why, where am I putting my time? Um, is the Lord the center of my life? Could I lose these other things and still be okay? Um, Israel couldn't answer that question uh, in the affirmative, I guess. And this is God's way of saying, you have an unhealthy and unfaithful love for these things. I need to reorient your love towards me to get things the way they need to be. And, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Cause That's we'll, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, but, I think those two mm-hmm. things go together. This thought of material happiness sometimes leads to, again, that's not a bad thing, but it can mm-hmm. lead to the attitude of Zedekiah that pushes God out until I think I need him. And, and, mm-hmm. and that's, that's what we're trying to avoid. That's what God's calling us back from. That's what he's calling his people back from. As Jeremiah continues preaching here in chapter 21, you're listening to Sharp Iron, talking to Pastor Joel Heckman today. We'll take a short break, but we'll be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233, 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Friday, June 18th. We're studying Jeremiah chapter 21, verses 1 to 10 with Pastor Joel Heckman. He's the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Okarchi, Oklahoma. Pastor Heckman, prior to the break, we were talking about Jeremiah's answer to Zedekiah's request. And the wonderful deed that the Lord is going to do is actually to destroy Jerusalem and to Judah. Certainly not the answer that Zedekiah was probably looking for. It's a very strong answer. In verse 5, where the Lord says, I myself will fight against you with outstretched hand and strong arm. That language is reminiscent of the Exodus, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And if you go back to it's uh, Deuteronomy 26, verse 8, this is one of the few things I thought of when I read 
uh, Jeremiah 21, 5, uh, Deuteronomy 26, 8 says, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Uh, so they're really close to what Jeremiah is saying here with, with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. And then even, uh, chapter four, verse 34 in Deuteronomy has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, and by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great deeds of terror, all of which the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? So the tragic reality here, the, the sadness is the way God was working for Israel, when he brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, that's completely reversed here, where I know we often talk about this phrase for you as being a critical phrase when we talk about the blessings of God and uh, the forgiveness of God and and what Christ did for us is for you. But imagine if (laughs) um, going from God being for you to God being against you, um, you can if that happens, you are absolutely in the wrong. You are sinning, and it must have gotten to a very, very dire point for God to start working against you. Um, but in in that same breath, you'd say this working against Israel is actually, and we'll expand on this in a little bit, I think, but um, it's actually God working for Israel. Um, this is the way that God will reverse their idolatry. He will bring them to repentance, and um, and and you'll probably get to this in a handful of sessions. But Jeremiah twenty three is a very hopeful message, kind of buried in the middle of a lot of gloom and despair, as Jeremiah prophesying about the righteous branch Jesus, who is contrasted with. Um, not only the vacillating kings, the unfaithful kings, but also the unfaithful prophets, um, where he would lead his sheep into um, righteousness. He would tell them the word of God, not the word of man. Um, and so, even you know, even even in this great reversal, a stark contrast from what he did in Egypt, God still is ultimately working for his people. It's just it's tragic that it get, has to get to this point where, you know, Moses has these wonderful things to say. The Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. And now Jeremiah, um, I'm sure he has, finds no pleasure in doing this. He says, now God himself will fight against you with an outstretched hand mm. and a strong arm. So it's, it's really, it's really, um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's it's um, sobering uh, to see just how far Israel had gone. It's so sad when you know in this particular instance. So I think we need to let that soak in a little bit. And see, just sin does have consequences, and um, God does not delight in doing this. But it's we 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 have to assume that this is what needed to be done to bring Israel to a point of repentance and restoration. Right. And I think, I think that reference to the Exodus is helpful. If the Lord is fighting against his people here, as he says he is, then that, that means that they've put themselves in the position of the Egyptians from the book of Exodus. And when Mm -hmm. you, when you think about that whole narrative and what God is doing there, he is certainly freeing his people from slavery, He's also showing the Egyptians that their idols are really not gods at all, which is is certainly something that he needs to do for his own people here. And and I think several times in the book of Exodus, he says that he does these signs and wonders among the Egyptians so that they would know that he is the Lord, Mm -hmm. that even in those acts of judgment, which are very great against the people of Egypt, there is an aspect of calling the people of Egypt to repentance and faith. And we do know that some of the Egyptians actually did leave Egypt with the people of Israel in the Exodus. <laughs> and I, I, my point is in all of that, it is it is a sobering reality, as you said, to see the people of Judah and Jerusalem now in the place of the Egyptians and the Lord working his wonders against them, using his mighty hand and his outstretched arm against them. But that larger context invites us into to see that, that the Lord's not just out for some kind of vengeance or some sort of pleasure in hurting his people. Rather, he is doing this 
for the purpose of calling them to repentance. And so I, I mm-hmm. think that's a that's a helpful helpful point of comparison. As as the text continues into verses six and seven, Nebuchadnezzar, the instrument of the Lord's wrath against his people, is is not going to show any compassion, any pity. Which again, for for the Lord to direct things in that way seems the opposite of of what we should what we would expect. Uh, mm-hmm. What what's going on here in these next couple of verses? So we see uh, some really difficult phrases, and I'll um, I'll focus on especially verses six. Well, I mean, you might even include five too uh, when it says, "I'll fight against you." I'll strike down the inhabitants of this city. Uh, I will give Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants, and the people in the city who survived the pestilence, sword, and famine into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and so very difficult phrases where one, one common criticism or attack or, or concern I, I hear when people talk about God is they, he seems to be an inconsistent God where he he'll turn on a dime. He'll be merciful one minute and wrathful the next. And he's just unpredictable. And even when people compare the God, they say the God of the old covenant or old Testament versus the God of the new covenant, new Testament. And they, they draw this stark comparison that say, God is just an anger, angry, wrathful God uh, who is out to get his people. Uh, But that's absolutely not the case. And, and that's one of the great thing to, you know, not only with, um, you know, helping understand this passage, it's great to reference other passages in the Old Testament, but it also helps us see the consistency that God has, and He is consistently merciful. Where, if you if you use the analogy of a parent, um, I know Luther likes to really point out the fact that when we pray the Lord's Prayer and we open with "Our Father who art in heaven," He says we should approach God just as a child would approach their loving father completely trusting that he will be gracious and merciful toward them he will take care of them and this is really what it is here uh, you know any parent knows that if you um, have a child they need a mix of law and gospel discipline and compassion where if you if you lean too much on one and the other is absent you know too much discipline in your child um, <clears throat> excuse me will uh, will never know what it means to have compassion uh and you'll never experience that compassion but uh you know too much compassion um if you withhold discipline they won't know that there's consequences for sin so what is god doing here when he says i will not pity them or spare them or have compassion on them he's responding to their sinfulness he's bringing uh judgment on them that is again completely justified and uh he is he is disciplining his children with the ultimate end of restoring them. And I, I, I found a uh, quote in uh, it's Horace Hummel's The Word Becoming Flesh, a great resource on the Old Testament for anyone interested. Um, uh, uh, let's see. He, he writes here, um, although a developed uh, eschatology in one sense is not Jeremiah's strong suit. Eschatology is uh, the study of last things or the last day Uh, in at least the general sense um, of a sure future under God after the judgment. It is one of his most consistent and foundational themes. Judgment is never final or for its own sake, but above all is discipline. And he describes that as a major motif throughout the book. And I believe that's, it's going to come in here Um, where we we talk about, we'll get to this in verses 8 through 9 as we wrap up uh, in 10. Um, God is doing this. His judgment for his children is meant to bring them to repentance. Um, And we look at Hebrews 12, verse 6, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Um, So just to close with this parenting analogy, if you look at it, Um, a loving parent only disciplines out of love. The end goal is always the restoration and the healing of the person who has done wrong. And that's exactly how God is even more so in a, in a perfect sense. Parents are flawed in that, but God is perfect. Um, he forgives us and heals us when we have, um, done wrong. And, and maybe the last thing I'll point out, uh, I I think Horace Hummel points this out too. One of Jeremiah's favorite prophetic formulations in the book is yet I will not make a full end. Mm -hmm. And so that really makes it clear. God is not doing this 
you know, to uh, satiate some cruel need for vengeance on his people. He's doing it because he loves them. And you have to look at the broader biblical uh, narrative and, and keep God's, you know, consistent actions in mind. Otherwise, you look at this and see God's, you know, God's kind of cruel here. Yeah. No, it's not the case. He is, he is doing this out of love. Absolutely. And, and I mean, we get a pretty clear indicator of that within this text. A lot of the text that we've had in the book of Jeremiah, you almost feel like you're grasping at straws to find some gospel. But here there's a little more clear indicator of the gospel, of the fact that he's doing this out of love. Because after Jeremiah preaches very clearly what will happen to Jerusalem, how the city will be destroyed, Nebuchadnezzar's army is not going to just go away, the Lord then is, or well, Jeremiah is told to tell to the people, thus says the Lord, behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. So there is a way of life that the Lord is calling his people to walk. What's surprising is that the way of life is actually going to be found through defeat at the hands of Babylon and exile there. And death is actually going to be found by staying in the city of Jerusalem. This is this is one of the, the moments where you can understand why people didn't like Jeremiah. I mean, for, for Jeremiah to say, what you need to do is surrender and give up this city must have just blown their minds. But it is what he says. It's what the Lord gives him to say. And that, in fact, is the, the way of life as opposed to the way of death. Take us into this ray of hope that we begin to have in verses 8 and 9. Yeah, and... I, I, I kind of try to put myself in the shoes of Israel. How would you hear this? And it had to be a, you know, a blow to their pride, uh, a blow to their, you know, na- not only national identity, but to their just way of understanding how things would normally work where, you know, when you get out of a situation like this, it's usually from a mighty hand. It's usually from a great military victory. Uh, but here he's saying, give up this this rebellion this this attempt to defeat Nebuchadnezzar and that's the way that I'm going to bring you to life and and of course we um I think we'll get to this a little bit at the at the end here but uh their life was actually going into exile for 70 years and as Jeremiah tells them don't rebel uh, submit to the defeat that you have here and go just live your lives in the city, uh, in this nation, uh, be the people of God in exile, uh, remain faithful and, uh, just wait for the Lord, uh, to bring you back. And of course we, we see, I mean, it it must've been so terrifying too, just to be in this city where, um, the fall of Jerusalem is imminent. Uh, this, these attackers are, you know, out to get you, they're out to defeat your nation. And, uh, I can't imagine the terror of being on the the doorstep of that. So God gives their tariff the terrified Israelites a way of life where, um, you can submit to the, the Babylonians be spared and then go live in this city and really, um, you know, live to see my goodness when I bring you back from all this, which is, you know, we'll, we'll get to that in a bit, but it's, it seems to be, similar to what Martin Luther talks about with the, you know, you have a terrified conscience instead of trying to, you know, with, with sin, you have a terrified conscience instead of trying to make things right on your own, um, trying to do things to, you know, muscle your way out of your guilt and your, um, your sinfulness. Instead, it's, you know, God is the one who is active in this. God is the one who uh, will take away your guilt and forgive your sins. And it's not on your works. It's, it's on, it's on God. And that I, it's not a perfect comparison, but I see that happening here where um, God says, submit to Nebuchadnezzar. Don't try to do anything yourselves. Just go be the people of God with it, you know, with this terrible situation and see how I'm going to bring you out of it for good. And that's, that's what I see coming through here. Um, you know, surrendering to the Chaldeans who are besieging you, you'll live. So even in a strange way, it's a very hopeful thing. I mean, if I were in that position, I'd say, okay, I'm not going to die. Um, I get something's wrong here. And uh, I trust that, you know, uh, easier said than done, of course, sitting here thousands of years later. But it really is a gracious way for God to say, 
um, there is a way of life, even though you, it's very strange. I'm giving this to you. Mm. Well, and I think this is the the connection that I want to make with this matter of the way of life and, and how it had to be so surprising is that the way of life is ultimately found in trusting the word of the Lord, which is what mm-hmm. the, the people have failed to do so many times here in the book of Jeremiah. They've been putting their, their hope in the outward thing. So look, there's the temple, so we must be okay without ever paying attention to the word of God that was supposed to be preached from that temple, you know, or, or this matter mm-hmm. of peace, peace, when there really is no peace. We're in the city of Jerusalem, and, and this is the city of David, so everything must be okay, all the while not paying attention to the word of the Lord. Here mm-hmm. he, he provides the way out, again, through his word, and, and that word calls them to trust in something quite surprising. I mean, go surrender to the Babylonians. That's going to be life for us. That, that, that seems so backwards. Certainly it had to seem backward to, to the people of Judah. Then it seems backwards to us still. And yet we know this is the way that the Lord so often works is that he brings us through death and into life. And, and I think that's where, mm-hmm. you know, what you're talking about the terrified conscience really does fit in. It is, it's through that, that death to my sin that God brings me to life. It might seem easier to follow the way of Judah and say, hey, it's no big deal, I'm okay. But that ends with death. God would rather, mm-hmm. he, he says, here's, here's the death in this way, but I'm gonna use that to bring you into life. Mm-hmm. And I think you, you made this point in, your, in some of your comments you sent me. Um, it's, it's like God saying, here's what's gonna happen, trust me. Uh, when I, I think it was when he gave them manna, he said, okay, there's going to be food here in the morning. Um, he says, yes, trust me. Uh, you're going to give me life, uh, through surrender to Babylon. Yes. Trust me. Yeah. You haven't been doing it to this point, but, but trust me, I, um, I'm going to bring good from this. And I think that was, that was a really good comment from, from you. I hadn't thought of it that way. <laughs> well, and I, again, it's, it's just so surprising. And, and certainly we see why Jeremiah was persecuted the way he was, because when this is the message you've got, as you said, this, it's not going to be popular, but it does prove to be true that the Lord does mm-hmm. bring his people through deliverance in this way. Uh, we've still got about, we got about nine minutes here, Pastor Heckman, and, and we've got one verse, which I think this, this last verse, it, it seems to, you know, turn back toward most of Jeremiah's answer. The Lord says, I've set my face against this city for harm, not for good. And, and yet within this verse, and particularly as we, we use it to tie this whole conversation together, we mm-hmm. do see the Lord's mercy and grace in a way that, that ultimately points us to Christ. So this maybe is one of the hardest verses of all of them to stomach. I have set my face against the city for harm and not for good. So we see God actively causing harm here. Uh, but again, it's what is the ultimate end of this? And that's the restoration in it. Um, and and this will be a verse that you cover in the future, uh, one that our hearers are probably fairly familiar with um, from Jeremiah 29, 10 through 11. So I'm going to spoil a little bit here, but I'm sure whoever talks about this will have a lot more to say about it than I do. But uh, Jeremiah 29, 10 through 11 says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, talking about the exile they're about to enter into, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. So I see a reversal of what he says here. Um, Not that God is kind of flip-flopping on it, but uh, in the present context, setting his face against the city is what they needed um, to show them uh, you sinned and here are the consequences when he says against the city for harm and not for good. Uh, the gracious part comes in that Jeremiah 29, uh, plans for welfare and not for evil. So it's kind of a neat play on words there, kind of a neat reversal that you see going a little bit into the future. Um, so without the law, we wouldn't know our sin, right? God's law is his will for his creation. Um, and it's it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Um, a lot of people kind of slot law into a bad category and gospel into good, but they're both good. It's just they, um, the law hits us differently than the gospel, but they're both meant to 
um, bring us into uh, into line with God's will, but also bring us comfort. Uh, so the law here is really heavy in chapter 21. The gospel comes in various places, but especially in, in chapter 29, where God says things are very difficult now, and deservedly so, but they're not hopeless. Um, there, There is the... the I will not make a full end of you. Again, going back to that phrase from Jeremiah. And one other connection I really, I I thought was pretty strong here was to uh, the cross, especially when uh, God should have set his face against us for harm and not for good uh, in our sin. Um, But what does he do when Christ is on the cross? Um, He turns his face away from Christ. He turns his back on the Son as he hangs on the cross with our sins and Christ in our place takes the wrath of God and the judgment of God willingly, you know, not, he wasn't forced to do it. He did it because he wanted to, um, to save us from our sin and to preserve us from the judgment that we deserved. Um, so we see kind of a lesser judgment that Israel got in exile. What they deserved was complete separation from God. But they never had to know that because Christ would ultimately take that upon himself, um, enduring hell in our place. So then what does God do? He turns his face away from Christ and then turns his face towards us, not in wrath, but in mercy, um, taking Christ's perfect sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection. And then um, we have that phrase, crediting it to us as righteousness, as Paul talks about uh, in Romans 4, that with some of that language with Abraham. Um, so I, I see... I I see some hopefulness even in the gloom here where we can make the connection, not just to the immediate history of Israel um, 70 years down the road, or even in that 70 year period, I think you pointed out too, God was still watching over his people then, but even further down the road, the ultimate um, recipient of the wrath of God would be Christ in our place and for us where uh, this just proves Joel's words from, chapter two of his prophecy, he is slow to anger, abounding uh, in steadfast love and relents from disaster. So that's the connection I see here. Uh, again, talking about looking at the broader biblical narrative, what what does this call to mind? And it, again, it, it emphasizes God is consistently uh, righteous in his judgment, but also gracious and merciful to his people. Well, and I mean, think to this way of life going through Babylon, very, you know, thinking it in terms of the whole biblical narrative, I think we, we can see that in preserving the line of, of the Christ that, I mean, mm-hmm. and, and this is, you know, think of in Matthew's gospel, where, the way he begins, the exile is one of the, the division points in his genealogy. What was God doing through that exile? He was still preserving the line of Christ, you know, so that he could do all of those things that you're talking about, so that he could turn his face from Christ on the cross, turning it toward us. And so even in this, again, working through death, what is the Lord doing? He's He's bringing his people, bringing us into his life. And, and even though that, that discipline, that that suffering that we go through along the way may not be pleasant at the time. Like that's the way the writer to the Hebrews puts it. It mm-hmm. it's what we need because it, it's, it does keep us maybe not happy to, to try to tie it back into there. It doesn't make <laughs> us happy, but the Lord has a better, better goal in mind to make us holy. And, and that's what he does in his son, Jesus Christ. Pastor Hagman, just a, a minute or two here with any final thoughts, closing comments on our text for the morning. Um, I'd, I'd say, again, remember, remembering some of the things we've talked about already, uh, maybe to emphasize a couple of big points here. Um, God does take sin seriously. It does have consequences. This is a reminder where God doesn't just turn his face away and, uh, you know, ignore it. Um, he does take it seriously. And and a, a big emphasis throughout the book of Jeremiah is the false word coming from these prophets and we tend to get in the same boat as Israel does when we either neglect the word of God or uh, maybe turn away from words we don't like to hear. So I you know, encourage our hearers, um, as hard as some of God's word may be to hear, um, it's even harder to, to go through what Israel went through. Um, so support your pastor, support the people who uh, do graciously uh, confront you in sin. And, and even though, again, it's like parents disciplining their kids, no one likes it in the moment, but 
it's ultimately for your good. Uh, but then also remember that God is, um, you know, righteous in his judgment, righteous in his um, condemnation of sin, but he's also gracious and merciful as he was to Israel. And, and this is, this is kind of a huge storyline. I think a lot of, maybe a lot of Christians aren't as familiar with as they would like to be. So I'd encourage maybe our listeners to look into what's, what's the history of the United Kingdom of Israel, the divided kingdom, and, and how does God's grace permeate through all of that? Uh, it's, you know, we know about the Exodus in the Old Testament, uh, the resurrection of Jesus in the New Testament, but this is kind of a, a really fascinating period of history where we see how low Israel sinks, but also how God's grace is even deeper than that throughout it. So I, um, I would encourage people, again, keep listening through this. You'll probably get a lot more benefit too, but, um, you know, it's a great story of God's mercy for us. Amen to that. Pastor Joel Heckman is the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Okarchi, Oklahoma, helping us today with Jeremiah chapter 21, verses 1 to 10. Pastor Heckman, thanks for being our guest today. Thanks for having me. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org or use the app to record up to a 60-second message with the open mic feature. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week.